Um, today, I'd like to talk to you about a project I've been working on over, um, gosh, I would say this is something like six years in the making, even though this particular piece of the work has, you know, probably taken over the last year. Um, and what I'm going to be looking at is this idea of individual level heterogeneity in criminal justice risk assessments. And I'm going to define quite a bit more about what I mean by all of those terms in just a moment. But before I do that, I should mention that this is work I did with James Jondro and um, David Dobson. All right, so what are risk assessment models? I think for the purposes of my talk today, we can kind of conceptualize them like this. So it's, this is obviously a simplification of something that's a little bit more complex, but I'll just give the, the, the bits of this story that you need to know for, in order for me to talk about what I wanna talk about. So these are models that essentially estimate the likelihood of some outcome. Usually it's a binary outcome. So whether someone will say fail to appear, that is what I'll denote by FTA, be rearrested, or maybe be rearrested for a violent crime, conditional on covariance. Um, so in this setting, it'd be something like criminal history, past failures to appear, or demographics. But usually demographics would be limited to something like age. Um, and so you would see this is really kind of a standard statistical modeling exercise. You know, you're, you're estimating the likelihood of some binary outcome given COVID variants. Um, and that's essentially what we're talking about. So once you fit that model, you would likely have a bunch of predicted probabilities for each person in your data. Um, and how this works then is those predicted probabilities would be binned so that you would say, okay, in this sort of toy example, everyone above say 0.3 would be lumped into the high risk group. Everyone from say 0.2 to 0.3 would be me medium high. Um, 0.1 to 0.2, medium low, and green low. In these different categorizations, um, one, two, three, four, as I've shown here, or you know the sort of descriptive labels like high or low, would then be used to inform what should happen to that person. So in the pretrial context, when someone is arrested, a model like this in many jurisdictions in the United States will actually be run. And then if someone comes out, say, as a four, it might be recommended that they not be released before the conclusion of their case. And this can have really profound um, consequences for that person. So, um, you know, some of the prior work that Jessica mentioned, I've looked at the sort of causal impact of essentially being incarcerated prior to a trial, essentially, um, you know, a higher likelihood of accepting plea deals that if you were out and able to fight it, you might not, et cetera. And so, um, right, we sort of go from this very simple sort of standard statistical modeling exercise to this thing that is, um, you know, hugely consequential for the lives of people. And so if you have been following any of the sort of work around algorithmic fairness over the last, let's call it five years, since this article first came out in 2016, um, you've probably heard of risk assessment. So this has really been sort of a central component of studies of fairness, um, especially in machine learning. It's, there's, there's this sort of famous data set that was released with the release of this article that I'm sort of linking to here. Um, and it's been used all over the place to demonstrate different methods for fairness. And so if you're not familiar with this article or, or that line of work, let me give you just a brief overview. So this is an article that came out and it looked at one of these risk assessment models. And it found that the false positive rate for African Americans in Broward County, Florida, in the United States, was about twice the rate of that for white people. So that's the, the two numbers that I've highlighted here in the red square. And so this really kicked off a whole lot of discussion about what fairness means in the context of a predictive model. So in this case, they're saying because the false positive rates were so different, that meant that the model was not behaving fairly. Um, and it, it gets fairly complicated what fairness looks like. There are other ways you could cut the data along the uh, sort of dimensions along which you could cut the data where maybe these disparities look very different. Um, but in any case, this is sort of this idea of group fairness where you have, you divide the people into groups, in this case, white and African-American, according to this ProPublica study, and look at different model performance metrics within each of those groups and define fairness um, from the point of view of, okay, if the model is performing similarly for each of the people for the for within those groups, then that's fair. Now, this is sort of, intention or sort of an alternative way of thinking about model fairness that's been very popular in the algorithmic fairness literature has been a notion of individual fairness, which is essentially people who are similar should be treated similarly. Now, defining similar is the crux of the matter. I mean, it might be tempting to just say, you know, people whose covariates like the Euclidean distance between their two covariates is very small should have similar outcomes, similar predictions. Um, but really the idea here is that there would be sort of more of a qualitative evaluation of what it means to be similar in the data. Um, but this is 
honestly a fairly good summary of what people have been thinking about in the algorithmic fairness literature and they've been applying sort of methods to achieve different group notions of fairness individual notions of fairness etc specifically to risk assessment models because this data has been available um, now something that is was interesting to me when i first came to this problem was that there is this really sort of similar discussion happening in the sort of in the sort of subject area of risk assessment, so in criminal justice, in in the area of people actually building these models, but it was a, it looked a little bit different. So in the in the previous case, when we we're talking about algorithmic fairness, we we're talking about group versus individual fairness, and in this in the other context, among people who are thinking about risk assessments, they are really thinking about group versus individual probabilities, and so it had sort of a similar flavor. And I kind of wanted to move over and think a little bit about some of the issues that the folks who were sort of embedded in criminal justice and been thinking about this for a long time, um, we're thinking about with respect to these differences. And so what do we mean by group probabilities? So in, in the case of group probabilities, we would just be saying something like the rate of the outcome by risk group. So if you recall, we have those four risk groups, the colors correspond to what I showed you before, and the bars here would just correspond to say in our hypothetical example, the rate of the outcome in the case I'm talking about, it'll be the rate of failure to appear within each group. And then those, um, those error bars would show something like confidence intervals around that group wise rate. Um, the gray ones would be for a smaller sample size and the black ones would be for a larger sample size. So this would just be telling you something about how certain you are about the average rate within each of those groups, right? And this might be a really important thing for policymakers to know if they want to implement one of these models. So if this RAI or the rate risk assessment instrument were the policy for release, so it defined who's released, who's not released, for example, what percent of court appointments would be missed in the aggregate? So what percent of people would we expect to actually not show up? Um, and how certain would we be about that proportion? Um, another question that is often talked about when people are validating these models is, are the groups on average different? So is an allocation to group four on average really different than an allocation to group three or are the groups, you know, within sort of the bounds of statistical uncertainty fairly the same? And that would be addressed by looking at whether these, um, these confidence intervals overlap typically. Now this is sort of, this is in tension with this other idea of individual probabilities, which would, which I'm, I'm illustrating with the following example. So again, with each of those bars, we have the average rate within each group, but if each individual actually has their own probability of the outcome, we could imagine two different scenarios. So in the scenario on the left, um, we have a small variance scenario where people are very tightly clustered around that, around that group wise mean. And in the, on the right, um, people are really dispersed large, like very broadly around each of the group wise means. And from the point of view of perhaps a judge, this might be the more relevant question if you're faced with actually making a decision about an individual, right? So how relevant is this risk label? So if someone gets the four, the high risk label, um, how relevant is that risk label to the person standing in front of me about whom I have to make a decision. Like how well does that characterize this person's actual likelihood of the outcome? And of course, to people who've been arrested and are being evaluated by this model, they might wanna know, is this risk label likely to grossly mischaracterize me, right? Maybe I am very, maybe I'm very, very likely to show up um, and I am a four, that's something you might wanna be able to know. And so um, I'm actually gonna skip this because I think this is a slightly longer talk than I have time for. Um, but I guess I will just say again that I think this is um, relevant to judges because in this scenario two on the right, um, we might have a case where the people are very dispersed again around the mean. And in the, in the case here in that sort of top group I have there, I've, I've sort of jiggered this so that um, about 25% of the people have less than a 0.2 chance of failing to appear who are in the top group. So even if a judge saw this top, risk, this top risk group, but they knew that people were highly dispersed, they might say, I'm not willing to say make a detention recommendation based on this label because assigning 25% of these people um, detention who have less than a 0.2 chance of actually failing to appear is unacceptable, even if it means I'm releasing a lot of people who have a, a much higher um, likelihood of, of failing to appear. And that would be in sort of contradiction with the, with the situation on the left. Okay, so unfortunately, one of the problems that arises is that if we only have one observation per individual, we really can't disentangle these two scenarios. So because we only observe this binary outcome, we can't actually tell the difference between if we're in the scenario on the left and the scenario on the right, where very different decision-making mechanisms might be at play in terms of how one might actually want to use these risk scores and incorporate them into their decision-making. Okay. Um, so again, if we only observe one person, each person one time, what could we do? 
but we could fit a sort of standard model and just assume there's no individual level heterogeneity. So for example, we could say fit a logistic regression or say a probit regression, which is what I'm going to do a bit, little bit later, give each person their PI hat. So just take XI beta, transform it, get it to PI hat, and then say, um, you know, this is this person's individual probability. But this is kind of unsatisfying as a notion of individual probability, because there's no component of the model that is specific to that individual. So if person I's covariates are exactly the same as person J's covariates, and there's usually really few covariates in this, um, then their probability, their predicted probabilities are exactly the same. And we would say they're exactly the same, right? And this sort of, you know, in this sense, treating these as individual probabilities makes the assumption that people are essentially, you know, the weighted sum of their covariates and nothing more, right? There's nothing more about that individual. There's nothing more about them that's variable than what you see in this low dimensional vector of covariates we've collected about them. Um, and so, you know, what we could do is we could just kind of assert that if you're in group G, your PI is about the same as the group wise average or your PI hat is your individual probability and just leave it at that and say that um, we're sort of assuming these empirical group rise rates are approximately accurate representations of each individual's probability. But again, I think that's a little bit unsatisfying. Something else you could do, for example, if you observe people multiple times, you could fit a single model to each individual. So say as they, as you see them over and over and over, hopefully not too many times because each observation is an arrest. Um, you know, you could sort of calculate their, their um, empirical rate of failing to appear and come up with say confidence intervals around that rate, et cetera, not really sharing any information across people. Um, now, I think there is a pro to this, which kind of takes seriously the idea that before the law, you're judged only on what you've done, not others. So no matter what everyone else did in the past, we're not you know, using that sort of data to make predictions about you. We're only using information about you to make predictions about you. But the cons are that you, know, this, you basically can't learn anything. And, and based on the number of times you'd observe people, you would have really poor estimates and um, the intervals would just be so large as to be useless in this case. So what we did in this case to try to really get at um, this idea of individual level probability was to build a Bayesian hierarchical model. Um, and so if you're familiar with that, this should look fairly standard, um, but essentially what we did, so what you'll see on the right is sort of the model specification with some notes about it on the left um, or in the middle. So the top part here, we just have YIJ is Bernoulli of PIJ. So that's that individual probability. And the PIJ is again, a function of covariates. And the only really change here is that we have this theta i, which is your individual level parameter. So this is the piece of the model that says this pertains only to you. This is the piece that sort of measures your individual level um, sort of systematic deviation from what we would otherwise expect based on the covariates that we've observed about you. Um, these theta i's, because this is a Bayesian model, we're going to need, this is going to be important. We'll have um, a distribution f sub eta. Um, and we'll have prior on our regression coefficients. Um, the regression coefficients are beta. So some pros to this type of approach is there is this individual specific parameter. So I think this is a reasonable way to take seriously this idea that people aren't just the sum of their covariates. There's something more about them. And as we observe them more and more, we can um, learn something specific about them. Um, but at the same time, it is a nice compromise in that the data will inform you about how much other people's information should influence estimates of PIJ. And I'm going to come back to that in a second. So there is, you know, you are learning from other people, but there is this component that is specific to the individual. Um, some cons to this type of approach are that it requires assumptions about F sub eta, and um, we don't have individual effects varying over time, for example. These are, there are elaborations on this model we could develop, but I think this really simple version that is like literally the simplest thing you could do to account for individual level variability is a really good first step to addressing this issue. So I want to come back to the assumptions about f of eta. So this is the common distribution across those theta sub i's. Um, so we try two different f sub eta's because the model can, these ten, types of models tend to be fairly sensitive to the prior distribution you have on them. Um, so we try two options. One is a normal distribution. Um, with um, this variable tau, which is the variance of those individual level random effects, um, with that one being normal truncated to be greater than, greater than zero since it's a variance parameter. Um, and one thing I'll note here is that this, this sort of specification is really nice because we have this tau parameter that basically tells us how, how much people vary about that, um, those sort of covariates, what you'd expect even their covariates. So 
just I'm going to come back to this a little bit later, but if we estimate tau here to be really, really tiny, like the say the black um, distribution that I show um, in the figure on the left, then we would sort of the data would be informing us that people don't vary that much beyond what we know about them about their covariate. So even once we know the covariate values, they're just not going to very, very much. We can actually estimate that from the data and we find ourselves in that small variance situation that I showed on the plot several figures on the in the plot several slides black back. However, if we estimate tau to be fairly large, like the blue line in that figure, well then, once we know the covariates, there's still a whole lot about the person that we don't know until we've observed them a bunch of times, right? People vary quite a bit about that mean as specified by the covariates. Um, we tried an alternative way of representing the prior distribution, which is a discrete mixture. In the end, the results really weren't very sensitive to this, so I'm just going to show you the results um, for the normal distribution, and you'll just have to trust me that it was similar for the discrete mixture. But if you're interested in the paper, I could, of course, send you that, and you could see the results for everything. Okay. And so the data we had is actually one of the largest data sets on risk assessment that I've seen out there in the United States. Um, it's extensive data from the Kentucky criminal justice system, ranging from about June 2014 to December 2018, and we reserved the last year as a holdout. So this had a training size of about 532,000 um, observations, which is much, much larger than anything I've really seen used in this context and hold out of about 80,000. The covariates are more or less what I told you on that first slide. They're things having to do with the sort of nature of the, of the current offense, um, things about the person, are they currently on probation, age, that was one of the ones I mentioned as a demographic, um, past failures to appear, etc. Again, we're predicting failure to appear during the pretrial period. And some other information in this data were the risk groups that were actually assigned by another model um, at the time that this person was arrested to inform the decision about their release. We're not, we don't use those code, we don't use that information about which um, group they were assigned to. That's for evaluation later on to see what, how, we, how well we think those, um, how, how much we think individuals vary with respect to their probability who are assigned to the same group. And really importantly in this data set, we actually got to observe multiple releases per person for many people. So for the majority of the people, we only observed them once, but there were a fair number of people. I don't have it labeled here, but I believe it was in the 30,000 range who we observed two times and 10,003, something like that. So we had a whole lot of data going up to many releases with which to estimate um, essentially the variance of that random effects distribution. So now let me go through some results pretty quickly. Um, so I want to think about this first at the model level. So this is essentially, you know, what were those parameters, those global parameters, the beta and the tau, what did those look like? I mean, you can see some um, our, our results here. So these show the posterior distribution of tau um, on the left. And we can see it's really pretty tight around this, this mean of 0.45. And so one thing that I really wanted to think about in this case when we're looking at our variability in P is how much of that variability is due to sort of the natural variability in P. So how much do we expect P to vary given fixed um, beta and tau? And how much of the variability in, in our certainty about P is due to because we can't actually estimate beta and tau, right? So the sort of variability we have for any in our certainty about, sorry, our uncertainty about any individual's P is this is the sum of how much p varies if you know beta and tau, and how much um, we don't know about beta and tau, right? And so I think there's sort of a more compelling story here if we say, um, you know, this is really due to the fact that we've estimated natural variability in p rather than it being the fact that we just don't have enough data, for example, to estimate beta or to estimate tau. And that's essentially what we find, and that's what I'm showing in the right figure here. So in the right figure here, one of the lines is, um, and I can't see it because your pictures are covering the labels here, but one of the lines is what happens, um, what are our posterior predictive, uh, posterior predictive density for p for the median individual looks like if we keep beta and tau fixed at their posterior mean, and the other one is if we marginalize over beta and tau, and it's basically exactly the same. And so we can conclude that what's happening here is we very precisely estimated um, beta and tau, which essentially tells us that we're sort of precisely estimating that people vary quite a bit. And I'll go into that a little bit more with um, all right. And so again, I want to come back to those risk groups that were actually in the original data. So these PSA risk groups 
were the grouping variables that were used by the model to make decisions about people in the criminal justice system. And the idea here is that we want to see first how well our model fits. So if we look um, in, in this red square here, so these are the groups one through six that were actually assigned to people when they were arrested. We wanna look at the rate within each group. So we see here 0.8 with the corresponding confidence intervals, 12, 18, 26, 36, 36. And so with the exception of the fifth and sixth groups, we, we see that the on a group-wise level, our, our estimate of the mean within the groups is actually significantly different, which is basically what people have talked about in the past, right? This is sort of saying, okay, the groups on average are different. And so we're sort of replicating this idea that if we look at this from the group level, if we look at this um, from the point of view of are these people on average within groups different? Yes, we would conclude that they are. However, when we start looking at our posterior predictive distribution for PI um, within those groups, we kind of tell a different story. So again, this is telling us how uncertain are we about the mean within the group, and this is telling us how uncertain are we about any individual's PI within that group. And that's what the black density here is showing. And so what this is essentially showing, I'll ask you to focus on the figure on the left in the red square here, is that even with, within each of the risk groups, um, our posterior our posterior predictive distribution for PIJ is really pretty broad for, for the people within that group. So the distribution covers pretty much the territory of all of the other groups. Um, so even if you're in that top risk group, number six there, there's a non-negligible chance that, you're, that your actual PI looks a lot more like the, the average rate for somebody who is, for, say, the average rate of group two, for example. So the rate that they say that you have, that sort of average of group six, um, you would be assigned, say, in that case, that'd be like a 0.25. It's say you're in risk group six. So on average, these people um, fail to appear at a rate of 0.25, you're a 0.25. Um, but really what we think once we've done sort of the bare minimum to account for individual level variability is that there's a decent chance that your rate is actually closer to someone who's, say, assigned to the um, group two. And we can actually, because this is, we have all these samples from our posterior, we can calculate things like the posterior probability that your PI belongs to group G for each actual group assignment. So if you were assigned to group one, that's what we see on the columns here. What is the posterior probability that your P, that your actual P fell within the range that is closest to one of the other groups, right? So if, um, for example, this model were really only had a very, very small variance around, um, if the random effects had a very small variance around those group-wise means, we would see a diagonal stripe where it would just be only along that diagonal axis. So in the one, one, the two, two, three, three, four, four, et cetera spots. And in, in fact, what we see is that there is a substantial um, posterior probability that a person is assigned to the wrong group or phrase sort of the, the reverse of that, the probability of the correct group in this case based on the actual groups they're assigned to we think is about a 20 about 25 percent so we think there's probably about a 25 percent chance that the um that the group assignment that was given to an individual actually ref most closely reflects their their probability of the outcome another way that we could think about this is we can look at the posterior intervals for each individual so this is a random sample of 10,000 of the individuals in the data and we've lined them up kind of in order here and we could we could do something a little bit different so rather than doing the sort of thing where we are thresholding and then assigning people to to classes based on their point estimates we could assign everybody whose upper end of their interval falls below the line to say a very low risk group and everybody whose lower um, interval falls above that same line above above that line to the high risk group so that these two groups don't really overlap right so these are the groups that we can sort of separate and say we think these are the people who are probably different from one another um, Unfortunately, if we do this, we can't really use this to make decisions very well because so, so few people actually fall into either of those groups. We'd have to leave, I believe it's something like 93% of the people in that gray region where we're just saying, and eh, we can't really with any confidence disentangle you from the high or the low. So again, this isn't especially useful for helping to sort of sort people into groups like you might want to do. And it's essentially the, the goal of this whole exercise. And um, I'll sort of start winding down here. Here's another way we could think about this. And I think this is a thing, a sort of direction that statisticians might have a lot to say about this area, but hasn't been thought about a lot in the fairness literature, which is thinking about um, sort of grouping in terms of certainty. And that this sort of follows from what I was saying before. So in this case, you might say, okay, we want to flag everybody whose personal probability that PI um, 
is greater than C and we have certainty at least H about that. So our posterior probability that your, your, your likelihood of failing to appear is at least say 50% or at least 95% certain that that's true. That's a little bit of a mind bend there because we have sort of two probabilities going on. So the H um, corresponds to our certainty about your personal probability PI and then we're thresholding that personal probability PI. And so what you see in this figure here is the proportion of people we could flag for various um, choices for H, our certainty, and C, that threshold. So the um, x-axis here is C. And so if we pick something kind of standard, maybe H is 0.95. So we say we want to be at least 95% certain that your personal probability, say, exceeds, let's call it 50%. We want to be, you know, at least 95% sure that you're more likely than not to fail to appear. Well, we can't really flag anybody. And so we really have to start cranking this down and cranking this down to something like, okay, well, we want to be at least, say, 75% sure. Oh, I'm in an area with motion controlled lights. Hold on. There we go. Um, at least 75% sure, for example, that your, that your personal probability, say, exceeds um, 0.25, and then we can maybe flag some non-negligible, maybe 15% of the population. But that seems like kind of a, um, a, a not, not so certain and not so high of a threshold. Um, and I would note that I, I actually kind of like this direction because I think this is consistent with the value that we should wait for enough evidence to accrue about an individual before flagging them and not just rely on point estimates that are essentially really noisy. Um, one thing I just wanted to mention here, and, and this is sort of alluded to in this figure on the right, and again, if folks are interested, I'm happy to send along the paper, is that these conclusions that people vary widely within their groups, that these groups aren't especially meaningful labels about an individual's probability of the outcome, are not a foregone conclusion of our model. So I, I sort of mentioned this early on. We're actually estimating tau. And if we had estimated tau to be smaller, then we would have gotten much smaller intervals. So right now we're seeing these really wide intervals, which essentially tell us we can't know much about an individual. That's because our estimate of tau um, is very, fairly broad. I think it was 0.45. I can't see it again because Zoom is blocking part of my screen. Um, but if we had estimated tau to be much smaller, then we could see um, in this figure on the right here how, how things would change as a function of n. So here n is the number of times we observe an individual. Um, and we see how wide our 95% intervals are for any given number of times we observe an individual. So right now the red line is what we have. And so um, we see that we'd have to observe somebody, I think it's something like 100 times before our interval would be between of length, say 0.1. So we'd have to observe you a whole lot of times before we'd have any certainty about your individual probability. However, under this model, if tau were estimated to be much smaller, that is, if the data told us that there was less variability and we estimated tau to be smaller, we could observe someone one, two times and have an interval that is small enough to be meaningful. And so I just wanted to mention this because um, I think often, often sometimes, you know, often the conclusion of one's analysis can sort of be built into the model. In this case, that's not true. This is, in fact, the data sort of telling us that this is what's going on. Um, really quickly, I'll just go over a few limitations. Um, one is the random effects distribution family. We did use another one, like I said, the results are qualitatively similar, um, but these can models can be somewhat sensitive to your sort of, the sort of family distributions you choose for that. We also used a linear model structure. This is in keeping with how people build these models typically and sort of our, you know, our, our justification for staying with this really simple modeling class of functions, these linear models, is because we really wanted to make the minimal change to account for individual level variability. So we don't want to add in all the bells and whistles and come to a different conclusion. We really want to say, look, if you do the bare minimum to add in something about individual level variability, the whole story kind of flips. And so that's why we've stuck with a linear model structure. But of course, there could be much more complicated structures you might want to, you might want to consider. We also have random effects are constant across time. So your individual level effect is always, is always the same. So if I have a theta of say 0.1, I'm always 0.1 extra likely to fail to appear relative to what my covariates say, and that doesn't change over time. <clears throat> Excuse me. Again, we could relax that, but that is just sort of a model elaboration that we might consider in the future. Okay, so I'll conclude now and say that risk assessment models are used to assign labels to real human beings, and those labels affect the trajectory of their lives. Um, this is something that is without a doubt true. So after we've, again, done kind of the bare minimum to account for individual level variability that's not 
um, accounted by for, with covariates, we find that there is considerable between individual variability that really swamps what little signal there is in the data. So there's not a whole lot of signal in the data, and we have wide variability beyond that among individuals. We also have seen from the one of the last figures I showed you that we'd have to release people an unrealistic number of times before we'd have small intervals to be able to really narrow, narrow down even under this model, which is fairly restrictive, what we think their probability is. So because we're estimating there's so much variability, we'd have to observe someone like 100 times to have a fairly small interval. Um, and I think another thing that's useful to think about here is that these groupings are maybe useful at the aggregate level. So again, if you're a policymaker and you say this is going to be our policy, it might help you with planning, might help you to understand how clogged the court system would be. But when it comes to making decisions about individuals, it offers very little information about that specific person. Um, and I think I'm actually a little over. So um, thank you all so much for your time. As I said a few times, if anyone's interested in more information, I'm happy to send that along. Thank you very much. We have some time for questions. Does someone have questions? Maybe Jess and then Savandi. Thanks. Thanks, Christian. That was a, a really, a really interesting talk. So my, my question is quite basic and it's about the, the data set that you mm -hmm. used. I'm just wondering about the completeness of that data set. Is it particularly complete or is there a whole bunch of missing data there? That is a great question. And if I had more time, I'd love, like, even in the slides, I'd have loved to go into that. So you're totally right. There is a lot of things missing. And that, are the, and that is essentially the people who weren't released because we don't get to observe their outcomes. And so this is kind of a standard, I don't want to say feature, but a standard characteristic of how these sort of risk assessment models are created. This is from, I have looked at a bunch of them. This seems to just generally be true. And it's sort of the reality that you just don't get to observe the outcome for the people who were um, not released. Now, I think there are some ways you could address this better than we, what we did. You could try to do some sort of like propensity score sort of thing. You, you, there, there are a number of techniques you could use. Ultimately, these would, you know, you would need to believe that you had the information essentially to know who would be released and who wouldn't. What we understand is that judges vary quite a bit in terms of like what the decision will be. So I, and they have a lot of information that will never be captured in covariates. Like they can actually talk to the person um, about what's going on. They can talk to the attorneys, et cetera. And so I don't, you know, I think at the end of the day, there were two reasons why we decided to just sort of go with it the same way that everybody else does in this field. One was because again, we wanted to make the minimal possible change to account for individual level variability and see if that changed the results. And, and it essentially did. Um, and the other reason is I think it's a little bit more transparent, honestly. I think in this case where we don't really believe that we have the information to fully understand who would be released and who wouldn't, any of those sorts of corrections are kind of likely to just mangle the story and make it a little bit harder to noodle through how you think that sort of data bias or the sort of, you know, the sort of selection bias is, is biasing the results in one direction or the other. Um, and so more or less that was a decision making um, process that we had there, but absolutely there are, there are, the people that are missing are the ones that were not released. But besides that, we do have a massive data set of everybody who um, encountered, who, who was arrested during the time period that we were, that we were considering. Thank you. Okay, so Vandy, and then it looks like we have a question in the chat. Yeah, thanks so much, Christian. Brilliant talk. I uh, wanted to ask, uh, so does uh, the individual uh, random effects uh, kind of thing, is it, uh, it so do you think so there are uh, something not captured in the covariates that can be uh, incorporated for later uh, data sets and things like that? Yeah, that is an awesome question because I think what you're kind of getting at, and maybe I'm reading between the lines here, is that there, there is some way that we could reduce those intervals, right? If we had covariates that were more descriptive or had or had more predictive power, you know, basically if we could increase the signal, right? Some, some of that variability might be eaten up and those, and those intervals would decrease. Um, I think there probably are other covariates you could include that would increase um, your sort of increase the signal in the data. There are a lot of reasons why these models are the way they are. One of the one of their sort of selling points at this point in the current sort of iteration that they look like right now is simplicity. So you have to sort of think about the procedure that happens when someone is released. In many cases, they don't actually like 
they want a human to be able to calculate these things easily so that they can sort of check for errors, do these sort of counterfactuals, like, okay, if I had one fewer arrest, like what would my score look like, et cetera. And so there is this sort of other consideration that pushes towards model simplicity and only really picking a few of the covariates that are that are probably the most meaningful or the most predictive. I think the ones that are the most predictive are probably already in there because these sorts of things have been developed over a long period of time. So whether you fail to appear in the past is probably going to be one of the most predictive things about whether you'll fail to appear in the future. There might be other situational variables that would be helpful, you know, when folks talk to people who fail to appear. Um, and I've really only heard this anecdotally. I haven't read a whole lot of like, you know, like surveys on this that are representative, but it seems to be things like um, not so much people absconding or running away, right, which is really how this is often conceptualized. It's like flight. It actually tends to be more things like someone couldn't get childcare, someone couldn't get a day off work, somebody just forgot, especially for people who have um, residential instability, like address changes, lack of ability to contact, especially because court dates change. I mean, depending on the jurisdiction, they can change fairly frequently. And so if you don't have a reliable or an easy way to be contacted, or maybe it's just slightly out of date, you might miss, you might miss that. And so I think some of those situational variables, like what the person's situation is, would probably add a little bit more signal. At the same time, um, you know, I think there's this temptation to then think of those causally, which I mean, I actually do think there's a causal effect there, but also just throwing them into your logistic regression model and saying, if we just change that, that'll be the causal effect on your, on your, um, on your probability is probably not the way to go either, right? So like what you might want, what you might be tempted to do is say, okay, let's just throw those in and then be like, oh, great, you don't have a car, you're going to be dependent on the bus, let's give you a bus ticket, right? Um, and those are really great programs. I'm not sure we could really estimate how that's going to um, influence any individual's likelihood in a, in a way that's especially satisfying. Um, I feel like I went a little off the rails there on like why people fail to appear. So I hope I answered that question. But I, I, I think that's sort of what you're getting at is there is the possibility probably to squeeze out some more signal. Just in summary, one, there are reasons why we don't want to throw in a whole lot of things um, and two, it gets complicated. Um, thanks. So question in the chat from Hobart. Uh, do these models help at all with addressing group level notions of fairness? So, so adding in the individual level um, random effect relative to sort of the standard procedure, which would be not having it in, is that more or less what you're asking? Um, yep. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, maybe a little bit bit. I, so I, it's, so when we start talking about the group level notions of fairness, we're sort of going a little bit far afield from what I'm talking about. I was kind of just trying to draw the parallel between what people have been thinking about in algorithmic fairness and this work, because there is this really kind of like nice parallel level of thought there. Um, when people start talking about group level notions of fairness, it's really things like, is the, say, false positive rate different? between the groups. Um, and usually that is based on making a thresholding decision. So you would say, okay, everybody whose pr who's prediction, again, say falls in the red, what is the likelihood that they were actually, you know, would, would appear if, if they're released? Um, and because the way that thresholding is currently done, um, that really isn't based on the individual level random effects, um, I, imagine, I, think, I think an argument could be made that it might help get some more granularity, for example, even within the groups of who's, um, you know, who, who are really missing or what the errors look like, since we have what I think are maybe more reasonable estimates of an individual's probability. But it's kind of a, it's, it's though very related, kind of a different question. Um, so maybe a little bit, <laughs> maybe a little bit. Okay, thanks. And let's take um, one last question from uh, UWA. Has a hand raised. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Hi, I'm Inge Koch from uh, UWA. Um, first, a big thank you to Christian for a fascinating talk. This was um, really interesting. I wish we could tell our students in the Bayesian classes some of your examples. I've got two very different questions. One is more on a statistical level and one is more on a, on a broader level. So let me start with the stats question first. 
uh, if I understand you correctly, you got typically one observation per individual. Now, mm -hmm. second time you would get individuals is probably if they are reappear again, being rearrested again. How would that affect your data set, the independence of your observations? The bigger question is, um, has anything changed as a result of what you're doing this over this extended period of work you've done over a number of years? Is there any effect, are the people who make any of these judgments or are involved with any of the arrests and so on, are they taking any of your work into account and if so, how? Yeah, so I'm gonna answer the second question first and I'm gonna come back to the first question because I think that one's a little bit harder. Um, and the second one I think is maybe a little bit more interesting. So this work in particular, I would say no, not yet. It's, it's hot off the presses, you're among the first to see it. And so it's not really out there yet. It's on archive, but um, you know, unlike machine learning, I feel like in, in, in these in these field in sort of, you know, criminal justice, people tend to wait for the stamp of peer review before um, really incorporating this sort of work. And so that should be ha that that was, it was recently accepted. It should be coming out soon. And so I, I hope this will have some sort of influence on the way people think about that there. In terms of my other work prior to this, I do think that has had some impact. So, for example, I did this evaluation and this is a little bit complicated. But one of the inputs to a lot of these types of models is um, some are these are, are sort of basically what the police officer at the time of arrest says the person did. And of course, those are things that have not yet been tried. Uh, they haven't pled guilty. They're presumptively innocent of all these things. And yet those play kind of a, those play like a major factor in determining what this risk score will be. And so I did this analysis that said, okay, if we calculate these risk scores using what the police officer said, these are called the booking charges, um, and, and see what the risk scores are. And this is what they are in real life. And then wait a couple of years and see what the person was actually convicted of and see what the risk score would have been if we'd only included the charges they ultimately were convicted of how would those risk scores change? So essentially, right, like, what is the impact of overbooking on one of these tools? Like if, you know, and to some extent, you wouldn't expect that the charges that the, the police officer says they did were be exactly the same as what they're convicted of, or else what's the whole point of having like the whole criminal justice process, right? If, every, if everyone's convicted of exactly those same charges. But at the same time, when you look at the list of charges that that are eligible to really change somebody's score, you honestly wouldn't think it would happen that often that someone would be charged with those and not convicted. So there'll be things like murder um, and things that are very serious, but they enter into these into these calculations in complex ways where it's hard to see how it all how it all shakes out in the end. And what that study found was about oof, 27, I think. I don't remember the exact number. It was about 30. I think it was 27% of cases had a higher risk level based only on charges the person wasn't ultimately convicted of. And I think that did have some impact. I've, I've heard people talk about it. It's been, it's been mentioned when people talk about that model pretty frequently. Um, they've also, since that study came out, and again, it's really hard to know any direct impacts you've, ha you've had because it's not like generally people call me up and be like, hey, we're changing this because of this one thing you said. But, um, you know, it's, it's, there have been some changes in terms of, for example, and in say, instead of saying like this person should not be released, um, you know, saying these are sort of the conditions of release and sort of changing some of the language around that. And I think that did play somewhat of a role um, in, in that process. Um, what else? Has there been any other changes? You know, what's, what's been interesting about this field, I think, is how it's really been central to a lot of the algorithmic fairness and like machine learning fairness abstract work that's going on. But I think a lot of that work doesn't really speak to the concerns of people who are actually like invested in this in this research area, right? There's sort of like the theoretical and abstract work that this is sort of like a neat toy problem and it's there's a data set and there's an obvious objective function and you can like put kind of a nice intro in your paper where it's like, criminal justice, recidivism, blah, blah, blah. This is high stakes. Um, we'll, we'll say like change our objective function and, and you know, get some, achieve some other notion of fairness. But what I'm finding having kind of embedded in this area for a while is that, you know, when you're talking about making fair models, it's a lot more than say achieving equality of false positive rates among different demographic groups. There's other considerations too, like what I sort of call like the ick factor, right? Like it doesn't feel right to include, say, say I had information on someone's disciplinary record in kindergarten, 
right? Should I be able to include that? Even if it's predictive, there's something that feels wrong about holding something against someone for so long. So there's ideas about, you know, sunset windows. How, for how long should you be able to hold something against somebody? There's all these considerations around sort of, you know, operationalizing this. Like, how would you actually do this in practice? We need to keep it simple. Um, issues around what sort of effects will this have, even if false positives are different, or even if positive predictive values are, the, are different, you know, there's this sort of issue of the data set itself coming in already representing a very skewed population with respect to race. So, right, so a lot of the conversation about this has to do with equalizing things by race, but that's conditional on who's already been arrested. And even when we're starting there, we're already talking about a distribution that's very skewed. And so, you know, thinking about this from the point of view of how is this going to impact, say, um, racial disparities and incarceration, how is this going to impact, say, overall levels of pretrial incarceration in the United States? We have tons of people who are incarcerated pretrial. They're presumptively innocent. I think a lot of people have pinned their hopes on these sorts of models to get more people out and I think the, the evidence is mixed. And so I guess what I'd leave you with with that long, um, <laughs> that sort of spiel there is that, yeah, one of the things I've taken from this is it, it's hard to see, one, it's hard to see the exact effects of your work um, lead to change. There's been one case, I think, where one of my studies did have sort of some direct impacts, at least I think it did. Um, and the other thing is that I think, um, you know, there's so many different trade-offs and considerations people make when determining what the right thing to do in these in these situations is that I think it's really difficult for any single sort of like algorithmic fairness study to have a huge impact. Because that's only like one out of a hundred different things you're thinking about. So even if you solve that one thing, there's a hundred other moving parts here. There's people are still trying to fiddle with. Okay. So now to the first question, which I think is a little bit trickier, and that's about we observe each person so could you, could you say that one again, just to make sure I fully understood? I guess to some extent, we have two parts of that question. One is, I expect you only observe somebody multiple times if they offend multiple times, if they, you, mm -hmm. you're at risk. So if you only off, uh, offend once in that time period, obviously only be in that um, yeah. period. You only get in twice if you are released or not incarcerated and you offend again, I assume. Yeah. But then, mm -hmm. How do you deal with reoffenders in the sense of the independence of your sample? Right. Okay. So we did think about this quite a bit, and we and I wish I could remember all the different things we looked at because we sliced and diced the data in a variety of ways to see if we thought there was any sort of like dependence across occasion on which we're observing you. But the thing is, when we stopped and thought about it. When we observe you once, that doesn't necessarily mean that, say, you're first arrested and you're never arrested again. You could have been arrested 100 times before that, and we just it would just happen to be before we got to observe you. And so when we sort of came to this, we had a similar thought. We were like, oh, well, the people who were only ever arrested once are sort of fundamentally different than the people who we observed twice, fundamentally different than the people who we observed three times, et cetera. But then we kind of took a step back and like, oh, we only really get to observe this one little slice in time. It's fairly short. Maybe you could say something about the rate at which people are offending being different, but it's it, it's not quite like these are the people who only ever were arrested once, and so they're different. And I wish I could remember. I don't. I'm not going to have a satisfying answer for you on this. I'm sorry. We did a whole bunch of different things, looking at you know residuals by arrest occasion and things like that to convince ourselves that it wasn't going to be a huge deal. And I, and this is now like probably a year and a half ago, so I don't remember all the details, so I'm sorry. But I agree that there, there's something interesting going on there and there might be some interesting methods to work on um, for, for dealing more satisfyingly with, with, with that issue as opposed to sort of these post hoc like model diagnostics to see if we think it's causing a major problem. Yeah, it's, it's obviously a very difficult question because you have a time point, beginning and end time point. So if you've offended just before that, you obviously yeah. before you wouldn't get in. Uh, yeah. But more on the um, conceptual level, but on the statistical level, how we deal with observations like that, because if you typically want an independent sample, then obviously that's violated if you get twice in the sample. Yet yeah. many samples where we, in theory, assume independence of the observations, I deal with a lot of medical samples and clearly these are not independent because they come from, you know, the same patient. Right. So that's, right. we, we still need to address these issues at times. Um, yeah, I would note that in our model, they're not independent. They're conditionally independent. The observations are conditionally independent given those parameters that we do have that individual level parameter, which 
marginal of that does drive dependence between an individual's observations across time. So hopefully that's picking up some of the issue. More about your work. It's absolutely fascinating. Thank you. All right. Well, I'd better interrupt. This has been a really great talk and a really great discussion. Um, so let's thank Christian again one more time for coming along. Thank you. Thank you all so much. It was so nice to uh, get to visit Australia virtually for, for a few minutes. Thank you.